فينبئكم بما كنتم تعملون وآخرون مرجون لأمر الله إما يعذبهم وإما يتوب عليهم والله عليم حكيم <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل اعملوا فسير الله عملكم ورسوله والمؤمنون in the name of Allah the most merciful and the graceful it is a matter of pride for scholars from different countries of the world to gather in our bearded Egypt, the land of peace, far from wars and the disaster. A great honor that science brings us together to help relieve the pain of the bereaved, and a great honor to stand in the land in the hands of my professors, colleagues, students, and friends to discuss what is new in uh, neurosurgery, especially brain tumors and functional neurosurgery, which is in cooperation with the International Society of Neurosurgery and Al Salam Specialized Hospital. With allocating prize to young surgeons to encourage them to research and study while making the award in the name of one of the flags of neurosurgery. And this year, it will be in the name of our professor, Dr. Usama al ghannam And I will let you choosing the star of the next year. Prayers for mercy for the neurosurgeon who passed away this year. To everyone, who are participated in this conference with support or attendance. I owe you, owe you all for your participation in this scientific ceremony. I would like to express my great thanks to WFNS presented by the co-chair of the Oncology Committee, Dr. Samih El Morsi. The promising guy awaiting more and more from you and we are supporting you all the time. Thanks, Dr. Samah. Also, my deepest thanks to Professor Dr. Kenin, coordination of the WFNS committees who cheer us in opening this conference by a special recorded word and he will join us at 2 p.m. today. Let us listen to him. Dr. Kenan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kenan Arnautovic, and uh, I greet you from United States, from the great city of Memphis and great state of Tennessee. I am coordinator of committees for World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, WFNS, I would like to uh, congratulate to Dr. Sameh El Morsi Hassan for organizing this second international conference of Al Salam Hospital in Egypt. He and his team put significant effort to organize this conference. I am proud that he is co chair of our Neuro Oncology Committee of WFNS and he's doing great work along with his colleagues on the committee in organizing uh, many educational events. Dr. Uh, 
Nasser al Gandur, our friend and great leader of neurosurgery from Egypt, has uh, uh, put a high bar on education over the past years, and he has made himself and uh, Egyptian neurosurgery known for that. And now we have a great uh, uh, successor and colleague of his, Dr. Hassan, who is now renowned in putting many successful uh, educational webinars and conferences. I hope I will be able to join tomorrow and deliver my lecture on craniopharyngiomas. I wish all the faculty and participants great success of this conference. And again, I greet you from across the ocean. All the best. So my, my great thank is to Dr. Ahmed al Khani, the chair of the uh, stereotactic and functional committee of WFNS. Also, he will join us uh, afternoon, inshallah. Okay, thank you. The first session with Dr. Abdel Kafi, Dr. Rabbas, and Dr. Abdelin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, dear uh, professors, dear colleagues, I am uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah Sudi, Lieutenant Colonel, Consultant of Neurosurgery, Head of, of Neurosurgery Department, Police Hospitals. It's my pleasure to be here and uh, I present to you our uh, department uh, statistics. First, I will talk about our hospital as uh, general overview, then I will focus on our department. Salam uh, uh, Specialist Hospital located in the east of Cairo. Uh, apply medical service to uh, surrounding area and uh, three uh, important uh, fast routes. Ring Road, Smalaya, Suez. Uh, it considers uh, one of the most important trauma centers in Cairo. This is the location of our hospital. Our hospital uh, service, uh, apply medical services for more than 200,000 cases a year. Uh, it uh, contains 92 inpatient beds, 22 ICU beds, 5 pediatrics ICU, ICU beds, uh, 12 emergency ICU beds. In 21-22, our hospital apply medical service for Impatient uh, volume about uh, 5,809. Uh, Outpatient volume 162,000.685. Gross unadjusted mortality rate was 
0.14%, hospital acquired infection rate 0.51%, average length of stay in days 3.9%, incubation rate 91.23%. This diagram, diagram uh, show inpatient volume according to months in October the maximum capacity 748 while in April was 358. Uh, this diagram show uh, outpatient volume maximum was in, in December 19,908 uh, minimum, minimum in March 13 uh, in uh, October 13,396. Uh, uh, Number of patients in emergency uh, in March and April 21,885. In April uh, 21,800. 85. Uh, list in October 4,632. Uh, 4, Our department was established in 1999 by Prof. Uh, Ahmed Ambar. He will join us uh, in Zoom. I studied at Tanta University, MD from Shinshav University, Japan. Neurosurgery department in 21-22. The second largest department in the hospital. Cubation in ICU beds, 10.4 uh, cases daily. They represent 45.3% from all capacity. Mean of stay length, 5.8 days for trauma patient and 3.1 days in elective patient. Impatient volume 1014. Our patient volume 23,578. 636 surgical intervention. Mortality rate 17.7 in trauma patient, 2.2 percent in elective patient. Mean of patient age 39.2. Readmission rate for inpatient within 30 days 1.33 percent. Number of admission in neurosurgery per month this year in June 77, February 66, March 85, April 66, May uh, 18, June uh, 106. This diagram shows the number of patients. Our department rate, our department rule. Salam Neurosurgery Department share in 588 operations this year. The third most hospital sharing rate all over Egyptian centers and second most hospital sharing rate all over specialized hospital centers. 1,040. 471 case consultation in program, 874 beneficial patient, 142 emergency case, success rate 74.1 percent, 45.8 good, 28.3 fair. Mortality rate 14. 0.2% in trauma patient, 4.24% in elective patient. Surgery required infection rate, 0.94% over all patient. Surgical intervention in 21-22, 588 cases. Second half of 21, 20, uh, 278. Uh, first half of 20. Two, three hundred ten. One hundred seventy nine case of lumbar surgery. Two hundred 
22 cases of thoracolumbar fixation, 6 cases of peripheral nerve entrapment, uh, uh, carpal tunnel, 18 cases of cranioplasty, 70, 17 cases of cervical surgery, 100, uh, five, 105 of cranial mass, uh, six, uh, 65 interaxial case, 94 case of shunt surgery, 8 case of spine mass, 13 case CB, CBA, 22 uh, pituitary surgery, uh, 44 cranial trauma, 22 scoliosis, 6 case of vertebroblasty, 22 meningocele, uh, 9 case of posterior fossa decompression. This diaphragm show uh, the most common surgery was uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, considered as uh, important center for trauma. Uh, most surgery was uh, spine surgery, lumbar surgery, the most common. This compared between 21 and uh, 2021 and the 21, 22. Uh, increased rate of cranial surgery, as we noticed, cranial mass uh, increased in 22 more than 2021. Uh, CBA, pituitary uh, uh, surgery increase, uh, cranial trauma, meningeal seal, uh, posterior fossa decompression, uh, more than uh, last year. This figure shows the most common surgery, lumbar spine surgery, followed by cranial surgery. Statistics in 2022 was lumbar surgery 156, shunt 46 compared to uh, this year uh, 94, uh, interaxial mass 44 compared to this year 105, cervical surgery 37 compared to this year uh, around the 44. Intracranial hematoma 32, nerve entrapment 22, extraxial mass 21 compared to this year uh, around uh, 44, uh, 65, spinal uh, tumor 12, dorsal surgery 12, microvascular decompression 5, surface decompression 4 compared to this year around uh, uh, 10, uh, intraventricular mass. Four vertebroblasty four, pituitary four. Uh, this uh, cranioblasty four, aneurysm clipping two, pineal mass one. This figure demonstrate uh, surgery in twenty twenty. This uh, figure show average length of stay variable between uh, two days to up to. Uh, 6.9 June, February, March, April, May, June. This depends on the type of surgery and the post operative care outcome of patient. Uh, as we mentioned the previous, spine surgery, lumbar fixation is the most common, spinal decompression, followed by uh, micro. Discectomy, vertebroblasty, uh, artificial lumbar replacement, spinal mass, intra laminar implant uh, zero. Uh, we didn't uh, did anything uh, from this uh, type of operation. Anterior cervical discectomy, uh, percutaneous uh, posterior pedicle screw, corbectomy, and uh, endoscopic discectomy three. Uh, this is the cranial surgery, a VB shunt 76, meningioma, pituitary uh, supratentorial glioma, microvascular decompression, cranial pharyngioma, 19 cases, intra, uh, infratentorial, intraaxial mass, 10, CBA 13 cases, uh, clubbing, uh, no, no others, variation. variation. This is all. Thank you.
next speaker, Professor Dr. Hatim Al Khouri, uh, speak about uh, neuroanatomy of cell and anterior skull base. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احنا بنرحب بالناس ويعني عاوزين نقول ان السلام احنا لما جينا نعملها مع الدكتور محمد حسن عملناها على نفس المنر بتاع الجامعه واللي ساعدنا في كده الدكتور احمد رزق حبيبنا واخونا والحمد لله يعني وصلت لفرايتس كويسه يقدر اي انسان يشتغل معانا ان هو يستفيد استفاده كويسه جدا ويقدر ان هو يحصل يعني في جراحه الاعصاب حاجه كويسه يعني النهارده ان شاء الله هنتكلم على السله وهنتكلم على جزء من الباراسيلر لان طبعا هي كبيره وكل سلايد فيها محاضرة أنا عاملها بس مش هينفع فأنا يعني عملت الكوندنسيشن ليها لأنها very important و very complicated pituitary gland as you know and cella located below the center of the brain and the center of the cranial base اشتغلش ايه؟ طب في وانت تاني؟ ماشي. ستارت تو ريموف ذا برين تو فايند ذا كرينيال بيز اند سنتر ان ذا كرينيال as regard uh, arterial venous and neural structures as regard the arterial the carotid on both sides basilar behind and above is the circle of wheels venous is the cavernous sinus basilar sinus and the circular sinus neural in the front here we can now zoom pointer pointer blenium sphenoidal and the recti gyri is above temporal lobe and brain stem behind above we can find the optic nerves and the chiasm circle of wheels laterally here we can see the cavernous sinus. And behind we can find the basilar artery and the clivus. And I su suggest this pointer is very important. The fish pointer, you have I dissected this specimen on the right side and left the basilar vertebral and the, uh, the left side with the sagittal view uh, uh, using the uh, spatial saw in the Dr. Rotten lab. And uh, we will focus on the cranial base around the paracellar and below the cell is the nasal cavity. We start with the nasal cavity and the nasal cavity is opened anteriorly into the face through the anterior nasal aperture, as you see, and the posterior into the nasopharynx. 
by posterior nasal aperture with diameter 25 mm vertically and 13 mm transversely. This specimen, I will show you the sphino smoid recess and recess. ركبه <تصفيق> 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 The sphino smoider recess, definition of recess is the verticulum of air space. So this is a hair sphino smoider recess, and the cavity is divided sagittally by nasal septum into antero superior is perpendicular plate and the posterior inferior is the former. A lateral, usually three medially directed projection, is the middle inferior and the superior cunica, below each of which is the meatus. The corridor, usually used through transphenoidal, with important structure will focus on it. Nasolacrimal duct. <coughs> And the canal is here, and drain to the inferior meatus, and the eustachian tube is around below here. And the maxillary and frontal is drained in different area in middle meatus. Uh, dissect the specimen by drill to show the then lacrimal smoid bone occupied the air cells and separate in nasal cavity from the orbit. And here we can see the superior middle and the inferior conicap and meatus below it. And on the right side here, this is the maxillary sinus. And I remove the anterior wall of maxillary sinus to show you the posterior wall. And the posterior wall is considered the anterior wall of Trigobalatine ganglion. Is this trigobalatine ganglion here? And trigobalatine fossa is uh, outside lateral wall of nasal cavity and it contains trigobalatine ganglion and the median nerve segment of maxillary artery and the <coughs> nerve. And the, you should know that the trigobalatine fossa is communicated to the uh, infratemporal fossa through the trigomaxillary fissure here. This is uh, a Dissection for trigobalatine ganglion sagittally. We can see uh, uh, here is the infraorbital nerve, and this is a great umbilatine nerve, maxillary artery giving the branches, and the median nerve is here in median canal. And the most important branch of maxillary artery is the sphenopalatine artery through the sphenopalatine canal. It's very important because. It giving a supply to anterior inferior part of the sphenoid sinus. <coughs> In this specimen, I dissected it tangentially with drill to show you the superior orbital fissure, optic canal, ostia, median canal, 
sphenopalatine canal for sphenopalatine artery anteroinferior to the uh, sinus. So the blood supply to the tissue along the sphenoid phase from sphenopalatine artery, it comes from maxillary artery. The hemostasis along this artery is very important if you intend to leave uh, the patient without back. This is some dissection to, sh uh, to calculate distance between the artery and the, the uh, ostia. So from this, we can calculate that pathing through the optic canal, superior orbital fissure not for, for, uh, far from us, and they take care when vigorous attempt made to strip or curate the mucosa from the wall of the sinus, otherwise catastrophe. Sphenoid bone, hair, circle of wheels above, nasal below, carotid artery on both sides, basal artery behind, cavernous on both sides. If we focus about the anterior view of sphenoid bone, it resembles pad with wings outstretched and they stand on ground with two feet. So, how it stretches wings, lesser wing of sphenoid two, greater wing of sphenoid, medial and lateral trigoid plate as a feet on the ground for a bat. I drilled the sphenoid bone to reach the sphenoid sinus and put here label for median nerve and the sphenoparatine artery. As regards the lesser wing of sphenoid, it's very important to protect the optic canal. So a roof of optic canal consider extension anterior root from the sphenoid body and the posterior root from the floor of the optic canal and the giving name optic straight. Greater wing of sinoid and the largest part of endocranial surface with the foramen. Don't forget this three foramen. Optic, superior orbital, fissure. Superior orbital fissure is a communication between the orbit and middle cranial fossa. In other words, between a greater and the lesser wing of sphenoid and left free to see no insult at all. All structure pass through it. Greater sphenoid, superior orbital, inferior orbital. And the question today, how many bones form the orbit? And enumerate. This is a question today. Dr. Samah can write it. How many? Bones form the orbit and the enumerate. Subir view, we uh, uh, know what is the tuberculum cell and dorsum cell. Where is the tuberculum cell? Between the optic canal is a chasmatic sulcus. And here to it, bilanium sphenoidal. Posterior to it is tuberculum cell. And dorsum cilli far and the middle and the lateral to it, uh, posterior colonoid. So, tubercum cilli sometimes protrude up, restrict access to cella, and this situation we can start to drill it or convert approach transfrontal, transsphenoidal approach. This is drill for plenum sphenoidal and tubercular cilli. And just uh, some points, anterior colonoid, medial to lesser wing, middle colonoid, lateral to tubercular cilli, posterior colonoid, supralateral margin of dorsum cilli. And dorsum cilli is continuous with the clivus, as you know. And the upper part is formed by sphenoid sinus, sphenoid bone, and the lower part formed by occipital bone. 
We can calculate the volume of the pituitary gland by this way, depth, length, and width. As regards the terion, very important because keyhole is very important to put in the right position. This is the frontal zygomatic suture and the fright, frontal sphenoid suture. Wrong to put the keyhole in front of the zygomatic suture. It put in the frontal sphenoid suture behind frontal zygomatic suture in this part. And to, to know it, I put a label here and start to make a dissection, leaving the suture in the specimen frontal sphenoid suture. And put the keyhole here. And the, you know you are right if you drill to find sphenoid ridge, this specimen, and expose the orbit in the lower part and the frontal loop in the upper part. Sphenoid sinus, separating right contents from the left. Varietes according to pneumatization in relation to cella. Cellular in 75%, precellular and the conical. The depth of a sphenoid sinus <coughs> defined as the distance from the ostium of a sphenoid sinus to the closest part of the cell. I put a speculum here and calculating adult uh, about 17 milli or 20 cent to 2 centimeter. If we, we put a speculum most commonly used for transsphenoidal surgery is nine centimeter in length, add to it a depth of a sphenoid, two centimeter, traversing distance 12. So the tip should be in the front of the sinus, not inside the sinus. In fact, this uh, septum, is uh, has a great variety in size, shape, and thickness, and location completeness, and is seldom to be symmetrical. The thickness of anterior cellular wall is about to 0.3 or 4 millimeter, very little, so we can open it easily. And this picture is very important because it's complicated to us different relations, optics, tyrogobalatin, and the cavernous on both sides, and the optics separated from uh, uh, the sinus also by 0 0.5 millimeter. The lateral wall of the sinus is the medial wall of cavernous sinus <coughs> is about also half millimeter. The fragmacella with the rule of 50, 50 round, 50 concave, and 55 millimeter. And if it has a deficiency, I would pushing arachnoid coming down and called empty cell syndrome. Pituitary gland, posterior lobe, and the gelatinous incontinency light and uh, adherent. Uh, the anterior lobe attached to uh, bars, <coughs> tuberous and the femur more dense and fibrable. I dissected the specimen to show you two things. The blood supply of pituitary, one from ophthalmic segment and the other, we will talk about it, and show the distance between the pituitary gland and the carotid artery. Paracellular area includes cavernous sinus and the middle fossa. We will select the cavernous sinus because it has a good relation today with us. Cavernous sinus, I think, is not a sinus at all. I think it is a periosteal content. Anyhow, on both sides of pituitary and the gland, and you can describe it sheep like boot with the uh, uh, superior orbital fissure relation anteriorly to petrous apex posteriorly, and is uh, just 
uh, uh, this uh, picture, I dissected it uh, 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 tangentially to show you the cavernous site envelope the carotid artery. We will dissect together the cavernous sinus, remove the outer layer to find the arachnoid and the trigeminal ganglion and the trigeminal ganglion, arachnoid and the dura is called the Meckel's cave. Has a lateral, superior and the posterior wall with two layers and the lateral wall of cavernous has the thick layers, outer and the incomplete, including the nervous inside. In uh, undergraduate in medical school, you used to listen to the arrangement of the nervous in the cavernous sinus from above to below, three, four, five, six. I tried to make a dissection to put it in the ground because imagine not like a rail. So the third, fourth of thermic division of fifth and on the carotid, this is the abducens, six, and the abducens pass in the royal canal below petrous phenoid ligament. What is this white below? The petrolingual ligament. I prepared five sandwich microsurgical skull base. This is the first one. Is the abducens between ophthalmic and the carotid. This is the first sandwich I uh, uh, أنا حسرع بس يديني خمس دقايق بس ولا سبع دقايق كده. خلاص هستوب. ما أنا خمس دقايق أنا حسرعها يعني خمس دقايق بس يفتح لي خمس دقايق. بس لكل واحدة من دي عاوزة محاضرة فيعني أنا هظبطها بس يفتح لي بس خمس دقايق هخلص إن شاء الله. فتحت يا ابني اهو ماشي الروف is a uh, oculomotor triangle, lateral wall for the face, the brain, middle wall for the bone, and white posterior dural wall. This dissection for oculomotor triangle, and uh, we will start to make uh, uh, outlines for venous confluence, uh, receiving a terminal from different areas with middle and to inferior posterior superior compartments. Indolence uh, uh, or uh, uh, clinoidal triangle is very important to three structure, and uh, we can uh, dissect to show the optical carotid recess, and this is the, uh, seems to like a baby face with the middle and lateral, and uh, uh, this triangle, the important Parkinson triangle because it including the uh, blood supply to the inferior hypophysial artery, Take care to uh, remove the anterior colonoid because it's emphasis rhinorrhea. Maybe a care because it contains air cells. And uh, this dissection to show you the carotid with four parts and uh, this uh, blood supply of the pituitary superior hypophysial and inferior hypophysial. It's coming from meningo hypophysial trunk of intracarotid. Uh, intracavernous carotid approach is, is uh, this approach and uh, when reach we can reach to this sort of the transphenoidal superior posterior and I dissected all to remove all bones to show you this 
and uh, I think he should uh, know the avoid damage of the nerves, carotid artery, drilled smith, and uh, all sets. So it needs more details, but I cannot complete because it's very difficult. And the Dr. Rotod, with Dr. Abdel Kafi, with me. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hatim. Uh, Muhammad Abdul Rahman. Uh, biology of craniopharyngioma influence on uh, uh, presentation, management, and uh, outcome. Please, yeah, any, uh, time. Inshallah. <laughs> Our biology موضوع صعب عينا إحنا كميديكال أونكولوجيست فأنا عارف للجراحين أحب أبسطها إن شاء الله في العشرين أو الخمسة عشر دقيقة معي بشكل بسيط إن شاء الله. أنا محمد عبد الرحمن أستاذ علاج أورام في القصر العيني. فين المحاضرة؟ بداية بشكر الشير بيرسونز بشكر استاذ دكتور رئيس المؤتمر ودكتور سامح على الدعوه الكريمه. افتح انا ولا تفتح انت؟ في دروور طيب بقى لك سلايدز ولا اقلب من هنا من هنا مش ان شاء الله بعد الانترودكشن هنتكلم عن البيولوجي اوف كانسر ان جنرال فولود باي بيولوجي اوف كرينيو فرينجيوما ان سبيشال will influence on prognosis management uh, so surgical or uh, systemic treatment. The origin of craniopharyngioma is uh, the embryonal element of the Rasex pouch being embryonal. We'll find a lot of embryonal proteins responsible for proliferation in the embryo. It is located at any point from uh, the cell to the third ventricle, it is uh, a relatively uh, low instance tumor representing less than 5% of the intracranial tumor with a good proportion occurring in pediatric age about one third to one half. Uh, the natural history does not involve systemic dissemination, but tumor spillage intracranial may occur. This is the most important slide of our talk today. We have two distinct types, the adenomatous type and the papillary type. The adenomatous type characterized by the key player, which is the beta catenin. Beta catenin is an important embryonal protein. It acts as a dual protein. It acts as an adhesion molecule, and it acts as a releaser for cytokines. So, okay. uh, the, the, key, the key player is the beta catenin in the adenomatous type. It acts as an adhesion molecule and responsible for release of cytokines. And the most of the presentation Management will depend on these two points. For the papillary type, the main uh, key player is the MAPK, mitogen activated phosphokinase. It is responsible for high cellular proliferation, in addition to the immune surveillance scheme. To understand the biology of craniopharyngioma, we should first start with the biology of cancer in general. The biology of cancer in general involves three major steps. Without these three steps, no cancer can occur. First is the cellular carcinogenesis, the formation of one cancer cell. Cancer is a monoclonal expansion of one cell. Then to grow and form a mass beyond the two millimeter, we should have neovasils, which is neovascularization or angiogenesis. The third step is the escape from immunosurveillance. Cancer cell is a foreign protein. This foreign protein should be attacked by the immune system. And to form a cancer, we should escape this immunosurveillance. All these steps are carried out by genes. So cancer is a genetic disease resulting from imbalance between oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes. Starting with cellular carcinogenesis, this is cell membrane. We have a transmembranous, transmembranous protein receptor, which is stimulated by a growth factor causing a conformational changes inside the protein, resulting in exposure of inner kinase part of the receptor to the cytoplasm. With activation of certain protein by addition of phosphate group from ATP, forming it into ADP, and now the, the first protein becomes activated. The first protein will activate a second protein, and the second protein activate the third protein, and so on, many proteins are activated, ending with this is known as a downstream of kinase reaction. 
This downstream of kinase is reaction or signal transduction into the nuclear factor, which enters the nucleus and stimulates DNA to form a complementary copy of mRNA, a process known as transcription. And the transcription will be translated in cytoplasm to form the proteins. These proteins are responsible for the angiogenesis, for the cell proliferation, for resistance to apoptosis, and this is cancer. So we can target cancer by antibodies against the outer receptor or tyrosine kinase inhibitor against any of these proteins. This is a cancer cell, and to grow beyond two millimeter, we need the vascular endothelial growth factor working in the same manner. The third step is the escape from immunosurveillance. Daily, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we have immunosurveillance in our body to detect any abnormal antigen. And the cancer is an abnormal antigen. If detected by the immune system, presented to antigen-presenting cells, it stimulates the T cell to attack the tumor by interferon cytokines to kill the cancer cell. And the cancer to form a tumor should escape this surveillance. It escapes through inhibition of this step, the detection of cancer gene through a protein known as BD1 and BDL1 interaction between the tumor cell and the immune system cells. So if we attack this BD1, BDL1 interaction, or if we give certain cytokines, this is called as immunotherapy. These are the three major steps involved in biology of any cancer. Coming to the craniopharyngioma, which is one of these tumors, we have, as we said, the adenomatous type. The key player is the beta catenin molecule. It is a protein that has a gene at chromosome number three. This gene is mutant, resulting in hyperactive beta catenin. It acts in the same way, transmembranous receptor stimulated by a growth factor with subsequent transfer of phosphate group to the protein known as axin. Axin stimulates beta catenin, and the beta catenin, as I said, is a dual acting molecule. It acts after the downstream kinase activation as a nuclear factor, stimulating transcription of many carcinogens. And the second action is it facilitates the action of a surface molecule known as cadherin. Cadherin is a Adhesion molecule helps to adhere cells to each other. So we have two events in the adenomatous type. Very good cell adhesion and release of cytokines. The release of cytokines like the head hook protein. Head hook protein is a very important protein and represents a target for us for treatments. It is an embryonal protein. Other uh, uh, cytokines involves interleukins, growth factors like transforming growth factor beta, Epidermal growth factor and vascular cell growth factor. In addition to the systemic cytokine storm, we have a localized form of stimulation known as baracrine stimulation. The baracrine stimulation is similar to that occur for dental formation in the embryo. And this may partially explain why we have calcification in the adenomatous type of craniopharyngioma. Coming to the second type, which is the papillary type, we have the MAPK, the mitogen activated. Phosphokinase responsible for rapid proliferation. In addition to the escape from immune surveillance, I have described how to escape. And the escape is present in both types, papillary and adenomatous. This is the mitogen activated phosphokinase pathway. In the same way, addition of phosphate group to a protein known as RAS, followed by protein known as RAF, make and the ERK, ending in a nuclear transcription and formation of cancer proteins. We have first mutation of the BRAF known as V600E. This mutation is very well known to us in oncology in the melanoma, and it is a very good target for the revolution occurred in the management of melanoma, actually. We have the same mutation in the uh, papillary type. The second is the escape from immunosurveillance. Now, how can biology affect the presentation of patients, and how can it affect our management? This is the main difference between adenomatous and papillary type. We have two peaks age for adenomatous, one peak age for uh, papillary. We have described how can calcifications occur in the adenomatous type due to the embryonal-like dental formation. How can they have palisades, highly coherent cells due to the adhesion molecule beta catenin? While in the papillary type, we have the mitogen activated phosphokinase. We have a lot of cellular proliferation and the escape from immune response, the higher proliferative rate res results in formation of multiple papillary and the solid form of the tumor. This is how can biology affects the presentation of the patients. 
Now, how come biology affects the prognosis? The prognosis of craniopharyngioma is affected by many factors. One of the most important is the number and the degree of surgical extension. And as you know, adenomatous type characterized by beta catenin, high adhesion molecule, so we can have adhesion to the hypothalamic structures. And these adhesions, I think, can limit your surgical technique, can limit your gross total resection. So there is controversy data regarding the affection of biology on prognosis, but most of data refers that the papillary type may be better prognosis. Now, can how biology influence treatment? Regarding surgical treatment, as I mentioned, the adhesion in the adenomatous type can limit the extent of surgical excision due to the hypothalamic adhesion. So papillary type may be better for you as a surgeon. This is how can biology affect your surgical technique due to this adhesion molecule in the beta-catenin stimulated adenomatous type. For the systemic treatment and the future of targeted and immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, as I mentioned, is to use molecules attacking BD1 or BDL1, the molecules responsible for the immune surveillance scheme. Targeted therapy is to use treatment directed to a cancer-specific molecule. So you can attack the beta-catenin or its resultant molecules. You can attack the MAPK pathway, the mitogen activated pathway in the papillary type. This is the MAPK I described. We have well-known mutations, the BRFV600, like occurring in melanoma and in some types of non-small cell lung cancer. You can attack by dabrafenib, a, will, a very well-known drug used in melanoma, and we have limited data in the use in uh, craniopharyngioma, uh, considering that craniopharyngioma is not so common disease. Another uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor is the trimatinib, attacking the MEK and BRAF. So by attacking these kinases and inhibiting them, you can attack the tumor and treating residual or recurrent tumor if not surgically feasible. Regarding the adenomatous type, we have two mechanisms. The immunosurveillance, also involved in papillary and the adenomatous, and we have the beta-catenin by its adhesions and the cytokine storms. Starting with the attacking immune uh, surveillance escape, uh, intravenous, uh, intracystic interferon has been used for adenomatous type, not papillary, because the cyst is present in the adenomatous rather than the papillary type. And the future studies is directed now toward the BD1 and BDL1 uh, interaction. The drugs used in attacking this interaction caused a revolution in lung cancer, in melanoma, uh, sometimes in triple negative breast cancer, and we have a lot of diseases with success stories regarding the immune Therapy, I think the neuro-oncology should follow these success stories. Regarding the beta-catenin, we have the uh, head hog protein, is an well-known embryonal protein, a carcinogenic protein resulting from beta-catenin overstimulation. We have drugs used in attacking the head hog protein, and they have a success in medulloblastoma and in basal cell carcinoma, as these tumors are driven by the head hog protein. So they can be used in the uh, adenomatous type, and they have limited success in certain trials. Another uh, pathway is to attack the interleukin-6, one of the cytokines resulting from the beta-catenin, and we have also limited data. In most of these promising targeted and immunotherapies, we have limited data because of the low number of cases cannot allow for large prospective phase three trials. Uh, coming to the take-home message, biology is very important in understanding the disease. Any cancer, any tumor, we should understand the biology. It helps us to understand how it can present, how can we tailor our treatment. Still up till now, surgery, plus or minus radiation therapy, is the ministry of management of craniopharyngioma. But we are still facing the problem of residual disease and the recurrence where surgery and radiation therapy cannot act. At this situation, biology helps us and gives us promising targets, including attacking BRAF and MEK proteins, one of the MAPK, mitogen-activated phosphokinase pathway, in the papillary subtype, 
in adenomatous, we can attack the products of beta catenin like interleukin 6 and like the hot hog protein. And immunotherapy can help in both types. And thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mohammed, for this uh, very uh, nice presentation. And we'll move to the uh, coming one, which is by uh, Dr. or Professor Chandra Shakir. Uh, he is um, a changing uh, algorithm in craniopharyngioma surgery. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chandra Shakir, he's an honorary consultant, a professor, and head of department in Mumbai uh, Hospital, India. basis and probably our management will evolve over the next few years. Morphologically, I think when we look at the craniopharyngioma, we usually talk about a cystic uh, lesion, a mixed lesion or a calcified lesion. A purely solid lesion is not so common, though occasionally can occur. If we look at the operative uh, strategy for uh, Craniopharyngiomas. Cushing gave the name craniopharyngioma and described it as the most formidable of intracranial tumors. And probably the first successful surgical resection was by a transphenoidal approach by Halstead way back in 1909. Donald Mattson, in his remarkable uh, series in 1969, gave us a, a more than 40 cases operated before the advent of steroids and uh, given a reasonably good uh, uh, results at that time. Clinical presentation wise, we either get neuroendocrine disturbances as the presentation of uh, craniopharyngioma, more commonly neuroophthalmological deficits, especially in countries like ours where people uh, do not uh, come to us, present to us uh, uh, early. In children, raised intracranial pressure is a common mode of presentation and occasionally, you may get uh, psychological or motor deficits if the tumor has grown too big without uh, early not noticing it early. And <clears throat> patients presenting with a rapid visual deterioration and raised ICP require early intervention. Most others can be planned properly. So what are our goals of treatment? Our goals of treatment are to improve vision, to decrease the intracranial pressure. And I think the cure from tumor takes the third uh, space because Many a times it may not be possible to do it uh, in a, uh, keeping the good functional status, which is equally important because many of them occur during the growing years. And you will find that, uh, you know, similar kind of tumor, similar kind of surgery, you can get a normal looking uh, boy developing uh, into an adult and some people develop obesity and other hormonal disturbances quite commonly. And therefore, if we look at what is the best treatment or what is the standard of care for craniopharyngioma surgery, the Cochrane collaboration actually told us that most people recommended for the research because though half the people felt almost that it is likely to be beneficial, there was an opinion that it can also be harmful. The main reasons for this are the objections to aggressive theory is because is there a separation between hypothalamus and the tumor which can be easily dissected out and therefore there are these are several stages where people started you know removing subtotally and going for radiation 
as radiation seem to have some uh, role there. If we talk about only choice of surgical treatment, surgical excision still has um, the most important role. Should it be gross total or subtotal resection is probably being debated. Radio surgery has found a place in this and intracystic therapies are also important, especially in very young or mainly cystic tumors. The main extent, main areas of controversy, as we just talked about, is the extent of surgical resection and then also the surgical approach and then use of adjuvant therapy, not only what adjuvant therapy to use, but which kind of uh, uh, radiation should be used and is there any role of uh, the uh, newly developed biochemical uh, biomolecular markers. Surgery is dictated in most cases by the direction of the tumor growth and choice of surgical approach has a strong influence on outcome, especially in retrochasmal tumors. There is no consensus though as to what is the best surgical approach for this tumor and endoscopic surgery in recent years has allowed uh, the endonasal approach to be used more commonly and also an intraventricular endoscopic approach is also possible. So I think if you have a cellar tumor, then I think it is very, very reasonable that the surgery is going to be transphenoidal, either endoscopic or microscopic. Endoscopic surgery is becoming more and more common. When you have an intraventricular approach, I think there is no doubt that the approach is going to be a transcranial intraventricular approach. Again, you use a microscope or endoscope, depends on preferences and has some advantages uh, for either. The main concern is the large supracellular tumors, which require a greater degree of individualization. So this is a typical case. You have a cystic cellar or what we call infradiaphragmatic tumor. And this is one uh, patient, 13-year-old girl with, uh, you can see almost the diaphragm is stretched up. And there is no uh, question about uh, uh, what is the best route to approach. We approach it with endonasal transsphenoidal uh, surgery. And uh, you do a slightly extended approach, take out a little bit of uh, the frontal uh, base, and then you ligate the uh, inter anterior intercavernous sinus, open the lesion till you actually reach pituitary. Whenever there is a prechiasmal tumor, the pituitary is uh, going to be at the back. So usually you do not interfere with the pituitary and the cyst is being completely exposed. And once that is done, then you start removing the tumor. You are removing the calcified component. Now I am dissecting out the capsule. And eventually you come to a stage that the whole tumor could be completely excised. Uh, without getting any CSF leak because most of the tumor was restricted to cella and uh, we have not interfered with the stock either as you can see from this post-operative uh, pictures. Intraventricular craniopharyngioma, we uh, have written our experience in Frontiers uh, uh, Journal recently, about 24 cases where we have shown that uh, the best is probably an endoscope-assisted transventricular approach. This is a typical example. This is a recurrent tumor. Mainly, in the uh, there is hardly any component in the cella. The uh, pituitary is intact. And uh, this is the kind of tumor which has been endoscopically decompressed. And we've got virtually a complete excision by endoscope-assisted procedure. So it is the supracellular craniopharyngioma where we are still not sure what is the best way. If you have a prechiasmal tumor, which was the earlier classification uh, to show its uh, relationship with the chiasm, uh, the bifrontal or the terianal approach, terianal approach is being favored more common as Professor Sami has repeatedly said uh, that you can probably have a better exposure, but more deficits with the bifrontal approach. And in retrochiasmal approach, in a retrochiasmal craniopharyngioma, Though lamina terminalis approach was our earlier approach and Petrozel approach by, as uh, described by Al-Mafti, also has a great uh, application. I think it is the endonasal endoscopic uh, approach which is becoming more popular. And uh, this certainly seems to be the uh, kind of lesson which we have learned over the last few years because uh, uh, the retrochiasmal tumor seems to have more morbidity 
if you approach it transcranially. Once you talk about an endonasal transspinoidal approach, we are talking about uh, the possibility that the tumor could be in front of the infundibulum, within the infundibulum or retroinfundibular, and this gives a lot of uh, importance as to how you are going to approach it. So here, this is a young girl where the pituitary is displaced behind, most of the tumor is in front and going suprasellar, and it becomes much easier. Again, similar kind of a procedure, ligation of uh, uh, anterior intercavernous sinus, removing the calcified component of the tumor, and then uh, slowly pulling out the cyst and teasing it out along with your suction used, uh, being used as a dissector. And then eventually when the tumor comes out, you reach the third ventricle, see the aqueduct as well as the both foron of Monroe quite well and get a complete excision. And this is the girl who has developed quite well. It is about nine years now following surgery. And uh, she had a very small residual component, which was seen after about a year. And she was given radiation, but she's developing well. This is a transinfundibular kind of a case, which is very difficult in terms of preservation of pituitary stock. However, uh, once you have exposed the area and once you have seen the normal pituitary, you can develop a plane of dissection. And eventually you can see that I am taking out uh, the tumor capsule from the infundibulum. Uh, the manipulation does cause some deficits, but uh, they are uh, usually reversed if you do not cut the whole uh, infundibulum completely. And she's also developed quite well. Now in this kind of a situation where there is a large cyst behind the pituitary, you need to drill out the dorsum cellae. And uh, this is one patient. Uh, we have done three patients like this so far. Once you have done that, you push the pituitary in front and then you start operating behind and trying to remove uh, the tumor from behind. And this is the kind of cyst that has been completely excised. And for five and a half years, this lady was without any recurrence. Then a small uh, solid uh, nodule appeared after which she was given radiation and she is doing well now 12 years after surgery. Technical limitation of a non-aerated spinoid sinus also does not exist now with routine use of uh, navigation. And you can drill this out quite well with the high-speed drills which we have available today. And a complete excision has been achieved in this patient as well. Recurrent tumors can also be treated. And uh, this is one patient who had a cystic lesion predominantly, was operated, <clears throat> did not follow up, developed a recurrence. And again, we are operating with the transpinoidal approach. <coughs> And you can see that <coughs> the tumor capsule is being uh, sort of separated from the stalk and then you are entering into the uh, third ventricle here again. So this is where you can see the basilar bifurcation nicely in the interpedicular fossa and the stalk has been nicely preserved here. Uh, Post-surgery, you see both the foron of Monroe and the aqueduct here. This is the post-operative picture. When the lesion has a broad stalk and going even in the sylvian fissure, it is possible to approach uh, through this uh, uh, approach. Like in this particular boy, where you can see that uh, we have been able to take out the cellar tumor. The supracellar tumor is now being brought down. And once that has been done, once the uh, it is identified that the pituitary stalk has been preserved, we are trying to look to the one side. Uh, I have had to drill a little bit further here to see where we are. And then you can start seeing that you have entered the sylvian fissure here and you can start seeing even the middle cerebral artery after the nodule from here has been uh, completely removed. This is the post-operative scan of the same patient. When you have a largest tumor and when the patients present, may present mainly with hydrocephalus, what we have started doing is uh, not only to drain the, or put a EVD or drain the ventricle, but drain the cyst directly. Like in this patient, we do an endoscopic procedure uh, to put a, uh, to aspirate the cyst and to put a drainage tube in the cyst. And two days later, after the child has been fully worked up, the neurological status has improved a little bit. Then we go for endonasal transpinoidal excision and remove the tumor completely. As you can see in this patient, that is a fat pack which has been kept and the tumor has come out completely. We have described this combined endoscopic approach in the management of suprasellar craniopharyngioma successfully carried out now in about 27 patients. On the other hand, you can 
probably even stage your surgery. This is a large tumor. We first did a transcranial approach and uh, we have been able to excise this tumor quite considerably. And uh, after the excision of this tumor, you can see that some uh, part of the tumor is still remaining in the cella. Rather than going for radiation, we thought we'll give it one more try. And we operated on this patient through the transpinoidal approach after about six weeks. And uh, you can see that the whole tumor could be nicely removed here. And this is the post-operative scan. The best thing is this patient also has virtually no diabetes insipidus. And you can see he's developing quite well on a five-year follow-up without any radiation and preservation of stock even in such a large tumor. So I think in children, you need to be more careful. You probably can err on the side of uh, subtotal or not err. I think rightfully do a subtotal excision followed by radiation therapy. While in adults, you are more likely to do a radical excision. I think in children, there are some anatomical considerations, but it is possible to operate on children above the age of three years by endonasal approach. If you can take care of other issues, if your team is uh, uh, used to this kind of a, a care. I would end up by giving you an example of this patient, that this is a very large tumor again, which we tried to remove endonasally. After two attempts, we have still not been able to dissect it completely because of the adherence to hypothalamus. And you can see a small amount of tumor was remaining. And with proton beam, this has been treated uh, quite well. And it is about five years now. And there has been four years now. And there is no recurrence. Mild cortisol and thyroid supplementation is being given. Craniotomy primarily is reserved mainly for a predominantly paracellular tumor when it is heavily calcified or if there is a vascular encasement or if there has been any previous surgery which has caused injury either to uh, any important structure like optic nerve or uh, carotid artery. So this is a management of about 165 procedure in 118 patients and endonasal transpinoidal approach is becoming our primary approach in uh, last 10 years or so. Other important thing is our observation as well as there is a paper now which has uh, shown that uh, probably the hormonal disturbances are lesser uh, in number and more important lesser in intensity in the endonasal transpinoidal approach. And this is uh, uh, some of our patients in growing years who have been operated uh, for this disease. So my take home message would be that I think <clears throat> the treatment of craniopharyngioma is changing. And individualization is the need of the day. You have to see what is the age of the patient, what is the morphology of the tumor, what is the hormonal status of the patient before you decide how you are going to treat this patient and then follow it further logically. Thank you very much for a patient listening. May I call on the stand and uh, participant to uh, if they have questions now? Any questions? Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker, Professor Sorin Aldia, uh, Deputy of Neurosurgery Department, Paris, France. Talk about endoscopic endonasal approach for craniopharyngioma, the new gold standard. بنرحب بالرئيس الدكتور محمود صديق نائب رئيس جامعه الازهر للدراسات العليا والبحوث والاستاذه الدكتوره نيره عميله كليه الطب سابقا واعضاء مجلس الشعب دكتوره استاذه شاديه خضير اللي نورتنا النهارده عضو مجلس النواب دكتور استاذ دكتور ابراهيم عويس عضو مجلس النواب انا دي واحده بس انا الدكتور احمد رز مدير مستشفى السلام التخصصي يعني مش عاد اقول لحضراتكم قد ايه انا سعيد بالمؤتمر الجميل ده كان احد احلامي 
ان انا اكون ولو ذره صغيره في جامعات مصر ان انا اقدر اعمل حاجه من مستشفى السلام تقدم خدمه عظيمه واساتذه كبار الحقيقه احنا عملنا المؤتمر ده لقسم التجميل عملنا المؤتمر ده لقسم العظام وبنكرره لتاني مره لقسم المخ والاعصاب فالحقيقه انا فخور وفخور بمستشفيه السلام ان هي قدرت تتشرف بالكوكبه دي كلها شكرا 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 بروفيسور البرت Hello, good morning everyone. Can you can you see my screen? And can you hear me? I uh, I don't have any feedback. Can you can you hear me? We can see you quite clear and we can hear you quite uh, clear. Please go on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very happy to be with, with you for this meeting. I'm uh, coming from Paris, from the neurosurgical department of uh, the Rothschild Foundation Hospital, and I'm mostly in charge with the endoscopic skull base and vascular neurosurgery. So, um, as uh, Professor Chandra Sekhar said before, it's a very complicated issue craniopharyngioma. So, having a multidisciplinary team. It's essential for uh, this kind of tumor, and of course for other types of tumors um, in uh, in the skull base. So craniopharyngioma uh, was already coined by Cushing in the 30s as one of the most baffling problems confronting the neurosurgeon, and uh, that's uh, especially the case because even if it's a benign tumor, it's a locally invasive tumor which affects the pituitary, the hypothalamus, the visual and vascular structures. It, have, it has quite an unpredictable biological behavior and it's a very rare tumor which, uh, which makes very difficult to accumulate experience and so very large series are quite rare. Um, I'll, um, I'll speak briefly about the two different types of craniopharyngioma. Professor Chandra Sekhar already uh, treated this, uh, this subject. So you have adenokinomonotous uh, uh, tumors, which are predominantly in children, which are mostly mixed, solid and cystic. Very important, they have infiltrative irregular borders and they present the beta catenin gene mutation. The papillary variant is more frequent in adults. It may be solid or mixed, solid and cystic and has better defined borders, so uh, a complete resection, it's easier in this type of tumor, and it presents a BRAF gene mutation. There are a lot of uh, controversies about the management of craniopharyngioma. Uh, one of the most recent is uh, which is the best way to treat them. It is better to go endoscopic or conventional by transcranial approaches. An older uh, discussion was uh, radical surgery versus partial surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, should we sacrifice the pituitary function for cure? And of course, the role of uh, complementary treatments. Um, what is sure, it's a gross, trade, uh, trade, um, gross total resection offers you a highest rate of progression-free survival. Um, I think planned subtotal resection, it's um, best if you want to preserve hypothalamic and pituitary function. And this is especially true in children uh, where uh, the adenomantoninous uh, version is, more, is prevalent. Uh, recent studies have shown that endoscopy gives better ophthalmological results and higher rates of hypothalamic preservation. Um, the controversy is about uh, the best surgical uh, treatment is related to the disadvantages of the open skull base approaches. Uh, they, they imply a significant brain retraction, working through small surgical windows, sometimes manipulation of the optic apparatus, and especially a very poor visualization of the retrochiasmatic area. Uh, I think this is why we have so many approaches which have been offered for craniopharyngioma, the pterional, the eyebrows, the subfrontal, unilateral or bilateral, the posterior petrosal approach, the transventricular approaches. I think what's most important when dealing with craniopharyngioma is understanding where the craniopharyngioma started. 
And I think the advantage for endos endoscopic approaches start from the point that the craniopharyngioma is basically a retrochiasmatic tumor. It may become through its development a subchiasmatic or a prechiasmatic tumor, but the origin is always retrochiasmatic. And the problem is that most of the conventional surgical approaches give you a very poor view of this area, with the exception maybe of the posterior petrosal approach the other approaches don't give you a direct view of this area. Um, and uh, this, uh, this problem was already uh, identified by uh, Kassam as a group of Pittsburgh in, uh, in uh, two, 2008, uh, and uh, they offered this first classification of craniopharyngioma. Professor Chandra Sekhar uh, already spoke about it. But I think one of the most uh, important uh, papers about understanding the origin of craniopharyngioma was this paper from a Madrid group who identified three types of syndrome concerning um, the infiltration of the supracellular area, a pituitary syndrome, an infundibular tuberal syndrome, and a hypothalamic syndrome. It's very important to identify clinically these syndromes in your patient because they can tell you a lot about what you can and what you cannot remove. Usually when hypothalamic syndrome is present, this indicates quite an aggressive invasive tumor for the hypothalamus, and you already know that you leave some tumor behind. Um, and in this article, they showed that uh, the cranial pharyngioma can, can develop anywhere on the, um, on the long of the axis of the pituitary stalk. They developed a new classification, which, um, which divides cranial pharyngioma in uh, five category, categories, cellular supracellular, pseudo intraventricular, secondary intraventricular, not strictly intraventricular, and strictly intraventricular. It looked like a not very practical classification, but we'll see that it gives some precise criteria to separate the lesions and to understand where they come from. Uh, one of the criteria, it's a mammillary body angle, which looks in the deformation of the angle between uh, the plane of the acuticle sylvius and the plane of the mammillary bodies. Um, if the tumor is cellular supracellular, this angle will tend to be obtuse. If the, the tumor originates in the hypothalamus or superior to the floor of the cell ventricle, it will be more acute. So uh, the seven criteria for this classification are the cell ventricle occupation, the pituitary stock distortion, the level of the hypothalamus, the chiasmatic system occupation, the mobillary body angle, the type of chiasm distortion, and the tumor shape. And so it gives you five types. And using these seven criteria, you can predict the topography of the craniopharyngioma in more in almost 90% of cases. So these are the five types, and uh, I uh, I give you the, the reference in order to see this article, which seems to me very important for the understanding of the craniopharyngioma. So is the endoscopic endonasal approach a new gold standard? It certainly has quite clear advantages because it gives a direct corridor to supracellular, supracellular area, a superior close-up view of the relevant anatomy. It gives you better chance of stock preservation in large working angles in the supracellular area and a better appreciation of the limits and a better visualization of the cell ventricle. Certainly, there are disadvantages, and mainly the CSF leak. I think it's the main obstacle for the wide adoption of the endoscopic approach, and of course, the rhinologic complication. So, direct corridor to the supracellular area. Actually, it's very intuitive. If you use the two-point method described by Spetzler for uh, for cavernoma, it's very logic to uh, to uh, to uh, to choose the endoscopic endonasal approach. One obstacle may, may be the <clears throat> pituitary chiasm corridor, which is very, uh, very small in this case. But actually, where, while you are decompressing the tumor first, you may access very well and enlarge this corridor without problems. Um, I think the endoscopic endonasal approach is the only approach which can give you this kind of view. You see a panoramic view going from, going from the co anterior communicating complex uh, to the basilar bif bifurcation, also the preservation of uh, the stalk. 
and <clears throat> a superior close-up view of the relevant anatomy. As we, we have seen in the neuroanatomy uh, topic uh, earlier, uh, the vascularization of the chiasm sometimes resides in very small vessels like the superior hypo hypophyseal arteries and having the possibility to dissect very close to, to these vessels gives you better ophthalmological results and also uh, a better possibility like in this case of preservation of the pituitary and you see an image that you can never see in craniotomy of the mammillary bodies of the bifurcation uh, of the carotid and uh, all the perforating arteries. What are the limits for the endoscopic approach? I think the limits are the large subfrontal and lateral extensions and maybe not always the purely intraventricular craniopharyngiomas. Uh, this is an example of a case which has not a very large cystic expansion but there is engulfment of the internal carotid artery on the left side. There is a solid component uh, superior and the cystic uh, component inferior. So in this kind of cases, you have uh, uh, very stuck uh, communicating and anterior choroidal artery uh, to the tumor. So uh, pterional approach works best, at least in my hands. Uh, disadvantages, so I, talk, I talked about it, so CSF leak remains a problem and uh, you should aim for, uh, for diminishing as much as possible this complication. Anosmia and chronic rhinitis also are, are uh, significant problems. What is my take home message? So I think the endoscopic and nozzle approach is not yet the new gold standard, but it may become one soon. Mm -hmm. You should you uh, still need to tailor your treatment to the tumor, as Professor mm -hmm. Chandrasekhar said, and I think the equivalence of gross total resection and uh, subtotal resection plus radiotherapy should be revisited in the endoscopic area. These are data which uh, which uh, go back to the microscopic uh, time, so we should probably look uh, looking into it to see if this uh, is still true. Master different closure techniques is still a must. So I, th I hope I still have some time to, to show you uh, rapidly uh, an example. So this is a 27 years old male without past medical history, which came for memory difficulties and visual troubles. Uh, he had some, um, he had a large craniopharyngioma, supracellar and intraventricular which corresponds in the classification uh, about I, sp uh, I spoke about to the secondary intraventricular uh, craniopharyngioma. I'll speed through the approach. It's a classical approach with a nasoceptor flap, a large opening of the cella and of the tuberculum cellae, opening above and below the intercavernous sinus, which is coagulated and cut. And this is the initial exposure of the tumor. You can see that it's a retroinfundibular tumor. The pituitary stock is here. So first we dissect the limits of the tumor with the vessels. We decompress the supracellar part of the tumor. And gently separate it from the superior hypophyseal arteries on the right side. It's very important in this kind of tumor where the corridor is quite, uh, quite uh, small to debulk it progressively. And this allows you to remove the supracellar part and progressively make the superior part of the tumor go in the working area. Still a lot of tumor debulking. And you see now the, the intraventricular part comes into view and it may be dissected and gently teased out of the ventricle.
And now we are in the third ventricle. This is the most superior part of the tumor, which is removed. And this is the view inside the third ventricle. The pituitary stalk is preserved. A small residue of tumor. And now you see perfectly the third ventricle, the pituitary stalk, the lower uh, part of the optic chiasm. So preserving the pituitary stalk is not a guarantee for function. This patient presented um, complete uh, pituitary insufficiency postoperatively, but he had a very good, uh, very good um, postoperative course. The closure was done with the nasal flap classically. He did a very good uh, visual recovery and um, his, his memory difficulties improved after cognitive rehabilitation. The MRI showed a complete tumor resection. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizers and especially Dr. Same for everything. And I uh, am ready for your questions. Any question? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sorin. You're welcome. Now we'll move. Now we will move to uh, Professor uh, Albert uh, Sofyanov, uh, Chief of uh, Chief of Neurosurgery Department, uh, Taya Man uh, State Medical uh, School, uh, Taya Man, Russia. Welcome. Uh, okay, okay, moment, moment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we are here. Hear me well? Hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Demonstrations uh, done? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Poss possible to start okay. for me, okay? okay start. Yes, start. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a big honor for us, for, for our Federal Center of Neurosurgery from Tumin, just to uh, give our and share our experience in the excellent endoscopic surgical treatment of cranial pharyngioma in children. I am Albert Sufyanov. I am a chief physician of Federal Center of Neurosurgery, Tumeni, Russia. Also, I'm head of neurosurgery department in First uh, Sechnik Medical University and the director of Education and Scientific Institute of Neurosurgery from People Friendships University of Russia, Moscow. Uh, uh, our, our center located in the city Tumen, you see the Tumen is just midpoint of the Russia, just Ural mountain, and in this place, just middle point of Russia, stay our city Tumen. And the uh, Federal Center of Neurosurgery is a hospital only for neurosurgery, only for neurosurgery. We have five departments and we cover all part of neurosurgery. This is the city of Tumen, very beautiful city in West Siberia. And uh, the possibility, we have uh, uh, a lot of possibility inside of the high level neurosurgery. So why we have five neurosurgical department, pediatric, neurovascular, spine, neuroncology, functional, and we have seven modern operation room. You see like this, endovascular, uh, including 3D hybrid CT operation room. And about the surgeries, uh, we operate only elective cases and uh, uh, more than 4,000 cases, neurosurgical cases per year, and more, and all totally, uh, we start uh, work um, near the 10 years. Now, more, more than uh, 40,000 neurosurgical cases uh, we done. This is our hybrid operation room, for example, interpretive CT. Uh, we have a lot of uh, modern equipment like uh, like uh, laser, for example, a lot of uh, endoscopes, 
and uh, 3D exascope. So, and now I start uh, after a presentation about our center. Now I start about topic of our lecture. The topic of our lecture is the cranial pharyngioma. So <clears throat> cranial pharyngioma is <clears throat> rare, rare benign tumors of the central nervous system. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, in general, is uh, has incidence of the two cases per million persons per year. And a lot of classification we have, and uh, 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 previous lectures show us also beautiful, amazing classification. So, but in our in our hospital, we prefer the QST classification like this. Because we don't have time, I just only see this on the screen. Uh, this is the, from Stefan and um, McGill, uh, 2021. And about our experience about surgical treatment of paracranial pharyngioma. Uh, in, in this uh, uh, scheme, you see our, our, our normal. So first one, we estimate about the, the cystic and solid portion of the tumor. If the cystic portion of the tumor is larger than the solid, we go by this way, prove the Amai reservoir. And we, uh, uh, done the, uh, we, we will done Amai reservoir, put Amai reservoir inside of the, the cystic lesion. Uh, just, uh, just if uh, situation stable, just uh, only observed an injection of the drug inside of the tumor. If uh, it's not enough, uh, not enough, and uh, you have other indication, we go to the further mouth of the tumor by this way, by endoscopic or by microsurgical or endoscopic technology. For example, all, all, all people know very well Amai reservoir. This is Amai reservoir, what we use standardly in our place. Amai reservoir is a ventricular access device. Uh, with the interventricular inter catheter system for the purpose of the chronic access to the intratecal space. Amai reservoir consists of uh, ventricular catheter, dome shaped uh, silicon reservoir port position under the scarf. You see like this. In cases, again, with uh, cranial pharyngioma, with large cystic component like see, like this, in order to decompress neurovascular structure, we use the implantation of the Amai reservoir as the first stage of the neurosurgical treatment. You see on the MRI, the ventricular cutter access, cyst, and this is, uh, you see the Amai reservoir at the state of the foot under the skin before. So I, I want to show uh, some cases. Uh, case one is about the patient, female, six years old, uh, typical, typical, uh, typical complaints, typical neurological status. Uh, and with uh, this, uh, with this uh, uh, MRI uh, data, you see big cystic components uh, completely blocked third ventricle. So why we decide first aid to make a Amai reservoir treatment. You see uh, our special treatment for this kind of surgery. This is a special endoscopic kit, ultrasound, intraoperative, and, and, and the Tulum region inside of the operation room. Sorry, moment. This is this is our operation room just for this kind of surgery. Uh, this is the skin skin projections uh, about the, the cutting of the skin, a my reservoir, and so on. Skin incision first step, small one with the cautery because the baby is very small, so no 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 not lost the bleed uh, blood. completely coagulate all vessels. And uh, create the space under the skin just for the uh, silicone reservoir by the scissors.
bar fall, just for access to the lateral ventricle. And the uh, second step is very important under the ultrasound navigation. You see, in real time, it's very important. We precisely put endoscope, mini endoscope. You see the special mini endoscope. We put just inside of the lateral ventricle, very precisely under ultrasound navigation control. And now we see the picture from the endoscope. It's the whole reflexus. Foramen Monroe blocked by the craniopharyngeum, you see very well. And this is our target point. The dome of the cyst. The main landmark inside is very well recognizable. And now we start to put uh, lasers, uh, lasers, uh, lasers inside of the, our mini endoscopes, working canal. Because very important to create the, the size of the penetration just similar to the size of the ventricular contention. Because if uh, the finisation is larger than catheter, the contents of the cyst must go to the lateral ventricle. So, so aseptic meningitis is possible, so it's not good for the patient. So I, laser give our possibility to create very precise uh, finistration by vaporization of the wall. Just same for the, for the, for the ventricular catheters, the size. It's very important again. Aspirate, we go inside by the, by the endoscope and aspirate the contents. And the flush before the very clear water by saline. Aspirate through the working canal of the, our special mini endoscope. Now we wash again by the water, aspirate, wash, uh, put, put inside water, aspirate. You see now it's very clear water come out. So the, this is a time to recognize the target point inside the cyst to put the catheter steep. Now we check the, the, the cyst inside, in the bottom. You see, it's inside of the cyst. Mother body. And now we, again, checking, because the ventricle keeps cutting, Ventricular tips of catheter must stay in the uh, lowest in the lowest point of the cyst. It's very important just for good drainage after surgery. I check the point, you see. And now you see the, uh, the principal endoscope stilet. I remove the endoscope from ventricular catheter and the uh, ventricular catheter stay in the precisely place what I cho choose before. Put reservoir under the, uh, under, uh, under the space what I created before, under the skin. Unchure it, fix it by the suture. Hemostatic agents, taha comb, something like that. The check the patency, and now close. This is our technology. This is our technology of the uh, putting the reservoir catheter by uh, endoscopic control with uh, laser, possibility, laser possibilities. This is MRI after, you see the decompressed the cyst with the ventricular cutter inside, just on the bottom, on the bottom, tip of the bottom of the cyst. It's very important, just for effective work with reservoir. Uh, this is uh, possible also uh, uh, some other uh, options just for this um, uh, technology. For example, installation 
two catheters also possible for the multi-cystic cranial fibroma. And you see on the screen, you see the two ventricular catheters, the zero R, and this is uh, uh, our 3D CT data. This is example. You see the multi-cystic cranial fibroma before you see the two, uh, two, two cysts, uh, uh, no, 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 um, uh, this is different, different, different things because you see the contents different color. And we put first one catheter one and second to the uh, second, uh, second uh, cyst. This is after operation. Uh, okay, if uh, my reserve is not necessary, or maybe my reserve use uh, like a first step just for stabilize the patient's condition. Uh, another option is uh, very useful, even in child with endoscopic transnasal surgery. You see our experience about uh, this kind of surgery, and uh, uh, adults and uh, adults and child is possible, and uh, so why? Uh, 15, 15 uh, cases we have experience about the transnasal endoscopic, for example. Uh, completely, completely all. We have the total, more than 80 percent total removing. Uh, uh, this is a anatomy landmark uh, for the transnasal endoscopy. It's the same, practically same, just uh, adult or, 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 or child, you see. Inferior turbinate, hoana, nasal septum, middle turbinate, and so on. Uh, and this is, you see the approach. And this is uh, some uh, our te te technique for the endoscopic approach. First one, adrenalization of the cavity of the nose. Then middle turbine ectomy by push away the middle turbine, turbinate. just to create space, because endoscopy is the space, mainly. And then uh, out fracture the inferior turbinate. This is inferior turbinate, like this. Medial and then lateral, lateralization. After that, after the steps, we have a space, just for endoscopic approach, very good space. Uh, in this slide, I want to show some some uh, important uh, uh, landmark just for uh, in cellular and paracellular region. You see the uh, very good uh, chiasm uh, uh, and uh, objectivization, optic nerve, optical recess, pituitary gland, clavus, uh, internal cavitatory, and so on. Again, after drilling, we see the structures. You see the open carotid, this optic chiasm. Glyos, pituitary gland, cavernous sinus covering the pituitary gland. The anterior intercavernous sinus, very important sometimes if you want to cut it. Uh, anatomical features of the endoscopic transnasal transfer approach in children. You see the practically after three, four years, practically the same view uh, like in adults. So no limits, no limits for the uh, endoscopic transnasal approach, even in children. No anatomical limits. You see the distance between uh, uh, two internal cardiac arteries. It's the same, practically the same. Uh, second step for the, this kind of surgery is very important. The how to close uh, after remove the tumor. So uh, how that flap is very important. In, before this kind of surgery, you must understand and have good training just to create this how that flap. Otherwise, a lot of CCF liquid and the meningitis. You see the, our technology, how we create a standard technique. How that flip. So a lot of modification, a lot of modification, standard flip, you see, large flip, extended flip, and so on. So uh, our case about the endoscopic experience. So again, 
patient, six years old, male, uh, typical standard uh, complaints and uh, uh, status of the patients. We see the MRI before. Before we see, you see the big, uh, big uh, uh, cystic lesion of the tumor. So why we and the not so easy condition is the patient before admission of our hospital. So why I decide to put the first step in the MI reservoir and you see the ventricular catheter inside of the cyst after MI reservoir installation. And then we go and remove uh, tumor uh, endoscopically with transnasal approach. You see the anterior wall of the sinus. You see tumor inside the sphenoid sinus, it grows inside of sinus. I cut anterior row by the scissors. Use uh, some instrument like a perison. You see the how I drill optic structures, anterior, anterior fossa. And now a little bit more. Now you see very good uh, optic, optic chiasm. Now I open the dura. Go inside of the cyst. You see the very low, uh, the ventricular catheter from the MI reservoir inside of the cystic region. And now I start to remove uh, tumor by very careful dissection under the visual control. For this purpose, I use the angled curate and dissect from outside to inside. It's very important. Because it's very big, uh, big tumor, so I uh, open uh, above, cut the intracavinous sinus just to see a supracellular structure. Now you see very well, chiasm, remove uh, the under control and remove totally the tumor. This is uh, after we totally remove the tumor and this is another set of head. Very well, another set of head after surgery. No CSF tip. Case two also, standard typical complaints, decreased visual activity on the right A, uh, uh, but without electrolyte dis uh, disturbance. MRI before, and this is uh, the case, this copy case. I drill, I drill the anterior fossa, little bit laterally, now open the, the, the bone, this anterior of the pituitary gland now, I open the dura, open the dura above the chiasm also. I also uh, transect inter anterior intercavenous sinus just to see very well suprasteric components. So I open very widely, very widely. At first, uh, drill very widely and then open very widely. And this give us possibility to dissect uh, very precisely because not pulling Dissection is very important in this kind of surgery because even if you disturb even small, uh, small uh, vessel uh, perforance, it will be catastrophic. So I, you see only dissection, only dissection. And, you, and you, if you see very, uh, very clear cut, cut by scissors. Dissect, dissecting, sharp dissection, gland dissection. But under the visual control, under the visual control, it's very important. And then cut. So preserve all structure, stack, and so on, like this optic chiasm with the third ventricle anatomy.
see the main vessels inside the interpenicular system also preserved very well. And now after tumor removal, you see very well anatomy, there's the uh, anterior uh, uh, vessels, communicating anatomy, pituitary stack, chiasm, third ventricle, A1, A2, IPOM. So very well preserved all neurovascular stack, very important neurovascular stack. This is after operation, total removing, and very well another fetal fault surviving. Case three. Also big solid, uh, big uh, cystic pad. So why uh, reservoir MI installation? First step, you see the ventricular catheter from the reservoir MI. And now remove the tumor by endoscopy. By after stabilization the patient condition. So open the dura matter. Uh, open. Open. Dissect. Very well dissect. Again, neutral catheter, zero amaya. And then <coughs> typically closed. Because it's very adherent, so I don't remove uh, uh, ventricular catheter. Not removing totally all. So I, I, I leave catheter inside. If cyst regrows, amias work. After, good result. It's not a septal trap. Uh, microsurgical exoscopic technique. We have evol evolution when we go to the exoscope. You see, it's first microscope. Good microscope, this is a loop before, but now it's exoscope. This is a standard uh, position of the scope in our operation room, the exoscope, pneuma, special neural arm, exoscopic stand, 3D, 4, 4K monitors, so standard monitors and so on. This is the position of the surgeon, operation nurse, first surgeon, second surgeon, because the uh, all these guys very important because must move by very precisely by the uh, exoscope. Is the case? Is a big, uh, big, big tumor inside of the field all third ventricle also very vascularized, but growth up to the up to really up to up to the to, to the lateral ventricle. The uh, up uh, uh, body is very high. So this is supraorbital K-hole approach, minimally invasive by exoscope. Standard K-hole approach. Open the dura and remove the body also of the uh, not standard, a little bit extended, but remove the the, the uh, this is our modification of the rim orbital rim. Now the open the dura. Okay, drains the cyst. Uh, drains the CSF. Sorry. Is optic chiasm. Now I start to remove the, the tumor from the all windows. What we have in this situation is the optic is the chiasm, chiasm, optic carotid artery. In, in, internal, uh, sorry, internal carotid artery. This is optic. This is A1. This is this is craniofigoma between two optics. First window, chiasm. Now I open the laminar terminalis also. This is A1, A1, A2, A2. 
This is your anatomy, vascular anatomy. And I open also lamina terminalis. And remove totally. After removing, preserve all structures. Total removing after. So we have some advantages of the scope in this slide, you see, and some disadvantages also. Limitation. But exoscope is still in development, so I, I hope in the near future we have much better version. This is conclusion. And this is our uh, home message. Thank you very much. Please welcome if, uh, if some if president uh, walk we open for the fellowships. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Albert. Please uh, open the floor. Is there any question for Dorkart uh, Sufyanov? No, oh, yeah. okay. Any questions? Okay. I uh, don't have good here, good here, maybe, maybe uh, more, more here. So, uh, can we ask you a question, please? Oh, we have okay, a question now from it's the floor. Uh, thank you for uh, your illustrative, uh, illustrative uh, lecture. Uh, we ask about why you put uh, Omai Reservoir before you remove the cystic uh, craniopharyngiomas? Uh, because uh, we diminished, uh, we, we stabilized the patient condition and we, um, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's enough. So we, we try, put reservoir inside, stabilize the uh, conditions patient and, 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 and uh, we'll see what's happened. It's enough, so no, no big surgery. Sometimes it's enough. Thank you. And and after you decompress the uh, tumor size and cystic, it's much easier to remove all tumor totally. Also. Okay. Uh, my question is: uh, Which uh, vein uh, you illustrate or show us uh, the tumor near to the uh, foramen of Monroe? Well, which vein you used to use uh, as a landmark? If you are lost in this area, which vein is a septal vein? Uh, this, talama, this is a, like Y. y, y. So most important for the Monroe is the landmark like Y. You know the uh, choric plexus, septal vein, and thalamus triad vein. So it's structure like the Y. Okay, but it's very, which very vein well you found. used to use if you are lost? Right or left? Which vein you used to uh, used to where I am in? Uh, main, uh, main, main, main. I use uh, choroid plexus. Choroid plexus as a landmark. Yeah, and go by choroid plexus, and go. Uh, this is the way to the Monroe. I think it's the most straight vein. If you lost, if it's coming into the right, the foramen of Monroe, you are on the right side. On the left, the foramen of Monroe okay, okay, is the okay. left but, side. But in, Okay, I agree, but but vein is uh, because uh, uh, choroid plexus most most uh, common common landmark. But uh, choroid plexus is disturbed right. anatomy uh, very difficult to use it as a landmark or septal vein also. No, no, no. Vein is not 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 uh, uh, every time standard standard landmark. Choroid uh, plexus I recommend more than vein for orientation. Choroid plexus is my experience. Not vein. Choroid plexus. Thank you, Professor uh, Alpert. Uh, next speaker, Professor Dr. Amr Shahabi, a professor uh, of neurosurgery, role of gamma knife in management of managing difficult cases of craniopharyngioma. Uh, 
صباح الخير اساتذه الاجلاء وزملاء الاعزاء بشكركم على الدعوه الكريمه متشكر جدا today i will be talking about the role of gamma knife management in difficult cases of craniopharyngioma uh, actually there are no easy cases of craniopharyngioma craniopharyngioma management is very difficult uh, there are different management modalities surgery radiotherapy intracavitary treatments and stereotactic radiosurgery but no single treatment provides long-term control with minimal complications. If we look at the surgical results, the tumor control can be achieved uh, in uh, 45 to 90 percent according to literature, uh, which provides the best five-year control at 70 to 90 percent. With partial resection, uh, the five-year control rate can be as low as uh, 15 percent. Of course, this comes at the expense of mortality, mortality and morbidity. With partial resection, the mortality rate can be up to 4%, and with aggressive resection, up to 17%. Morbidity, as re recorded in literature, can be up to 80%. So in surgery, it's a delicate balance between trying to achieve tumor control and at the same time minimize morbidity and mortality. If we talk about radiotherapy, uh, external beam radiotherapy, it's photon radiation delivered in a limited number of fixed fields, usually two to six, with a target defined on the base of 2D or 3D conformal planning. But because of the limited number of fields used, the final radiation dose is less conformal to the target, and uh, sometimes uh, in the lack of image guidance, there are large portions of normal tissue that receive uh, harmful radiation doses. The 10-year recurrence-free survival uh, radiotherapy results can be as high as 91% uh, after a combination of subtotal resection followed by radiotherapy, but only about half of the patients lead a normal independent life. So radiotherapy is not without hazards. There are reports of radionecrosis, optic neuritis, uh, malignancies, cognitive disturbances, especially in young children. So, so serious morbidity after radiotherapy is reported in 6 to 18% of patients. The uh, American study with the longest follow-up median of 17 years uh, in which there was a uh, combination of surgery followed by radiotherapy was done. The radiation-related re complications were 58% for children and 46% for adults. Uh, in 41% of the deaths of the adults, which was not due to tumor growth, it was related to complications from radiotherapy. This is a depiction of the radiation distribution in, on the left side of uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy and on the right side of radiosurgery. As you can see, with the radiosurgery, there are uh, more concise and steep radiation falloff. Regarding stereotactic radiosurgery, incidentally, the first case treated by radiosurgery by Lars Lexell in 1967 was a case of craniopharyngioma. How uh, gamma knife is different from other modalities is minimally invasive. They're safe to the critical structures. Uh, morbidity as low as 4% and retreatment is possible with far less complications. The reported results in literature uh, tumor control can be achieved in up to 87% of cases with a wide, wide variability of results, uh, probably because of the variability of the series size, the follow-up duration. Uh, the different tumor types uh, have different responses, I, as I will discuss later, and the, the different doses used. The morbidity rate, uh, mainly hypotutorism uh, or visual disturbance, and up to 19%, but more in earlier cases earlier studies. So the main difficulties encountered with treating craniopharyngiomas with radiosurgery are mainly, first of all, the cystic part, which is less responsive than the solid part. As we know, there are three morphological types of craniopharyngiomas. They can be either be solid, cystic, or mixed. The second uh, problem is inability to properly see the visual pathway because of the tumor. Uh, and the third is the development of secondary cysts. First, the cystic part, uh, as I said, is less responsive to, uh, to radiation than the solid part. Uh, it is the main cause of tumor enlargement. Uh, the solid part responds to lower doses than the cystic part. 
Uh, this is probably because the uh, papillary type, uh, the solid type is a papillary type, which is more radiosensitive than the adamantanomatous type, which is the cystic type. The second problem we encounter is the inability to properly visualize the optic pathway, either postoperatively due to adhesions, reaction uh, from uh, cyst fluids in the cistern, so a clear definition of anatomy may be not possible. The other is the uh, uh, way the uh, craniopharyngiomas grow around the optic pathway, usually above and below, and so obscure the visual pathway so we cannot treat what we cannot see. Unlike other suprasellar tumors, like pituitary adenomas or meningiomas, which displace the optic pathway to one side, anterior or posterior. The third problem is the development of secondary cysts or multiple cysts. Best outcomes we found are with monocystic tumors. Regarding the dose we use with uh, gamma knife radiosurgery, in earlier studies, the pilot st first pilot study done by Lars Lexell and published in 1971, uh, used doses ranging from 3 to 25 grays. Of course, very wide range because it was empirical and we do not know at the time what the proper dose was. But now, uh, with accumulation of literature, we know that the dose ranges from 6 to 12 grays. Limited, of course, by the tolerability of the visual pathway, which we now know uh, to uh, uh, withstand doses up to 10 grays. The indications of craniopharyngioma management may be uh, with gamma knife, maybe either a residual tumor, a recurrent tumor, part of a multi multimodal management or in primary cases in selected. Uh, important notice I would like to say about uh, the outcome after uh, treating uh, craniopharyngiomas, uh, assist reaccumulation after uh, gamma knife radiosurgery is not equivalent to a tumor recurrence. Uh, the uh, tumor wall of the cysts uh, has a latent p uh, latency to respond to uh, radio surgery, it uh, continues to uh, secrete some fluid, and usually in the first year after radio surgery, until it stops. And so, also the shrinkage of the solid tumor is not always accompanied with cyst regression. So, in a multimodal approach, the ideal protocol would be at the least invasive and minimal morbidity and mortality and effective as any other, long, uh, other protocol with long-term survival. So you have a whole arsenal of weapons you can use. So in a multimodal approach, we can use, we can do a before radio surgery for the uh, cyst. Uh, if the cyst is large and hinders the lineation of neighboring structures, we can do a cyst decompression to, to uh, relieve sim uh, symptoms and also to reduce the volume of the cyst and to be, so to be able to properly visualize the tumor and surrounding structures, mainly the optic pathway. After radio surgery, a minor stereotactic surgical procedure can be done to help manage the cyst enlargement I mentioned before after radio surgery. Approaches used to decrease cyst size either intermittent stereotactic aspiration, placement of an Omaya reservoir, Stereotactic aspiration in conjunction, in conjunction with same-day radio surgery, uh, and recently, as we said, as we saw in the previous lectures, neuroendoscopic cyst fenestration. So the debates in the management of craniopharyngioma, whether to do a gross total resection or do a subtotal resection followed by radio surgery, uh, as we saw before, the uh, gross total resection is accompanied by neurological, endocrinological, and psychosocial morbidities. The uh, far less uh, complications... Hello? Far less complications associated with a less aggressive resection followed by radio surgery. The second debate, uh, whether to do gamma knife radio surgery immediately after resection or wait for uh, tumor progression. Some pediatric series have indicated that gamma knife immediately after surgery, uh, up front that is, is preferable to gamma knife at the time of recurrence, the sal we call salvage, because of the lower rates of morbidity and improved tumor control, which makes sense. If you ha have a smaller tumor, you will be able to uh, uh, give a higher dose. It's, 
uh, farther away from the optic pathway, and so you can achieve better tumor control with far lesser complications. The concern of neurocognitive effects of radiosurgery uh, in this region, there is no studies on craniopharyngioma per se, but this is the study I could, could find uh, on pituitary adenomas which have the same location. As you can see here, there were no impairments on measurements or measures of general intellectual function or executive function in any patient group. Radiosurgery did not lead to adverse effects or for immediate or delayed memory in pituitary adenoma patients. The prognostics, prognostic factors we know that affect the uh, outcome are the tumor size, smaller tumor size, better tumor control. So we can either do a subtotal resection or cyst reduction, then do gamma knife. Uh, the tumor type, as we said, uh, single type is better uh, tumor control. Cystic type have uh, a lesser uh, response than solid type. Repeat gamma knife radio surgery can be done with better results, as you can see here, uh, a 44 actuarial uh, control rate at 10 years and a 61% actuarial tumor control rate at 10 years after repeat gamma knife. Our proposed, pro, uh, proposed uh, treatment algorithm, uh, depending on the tumor morphology, if it is solid, you can see the visual pathway and there are no compressive manifestations. You can go ahead with radio surgery. If there is compression or the visual pathway not properly visualized, then you can do surgery followed by radio surgery. Uh, uh, cystic tumors, if you can visualize the visual pathway and there are no compressive manifestations, then you can go for radio surgery. Otherwise, you either put in a stereotactic omaya or any form of intracavitary treatment followed by radio surgery. For mixed type, uh, if there is uh, uh, no compression and the visual pathway can be seen, then you can do gamma knives for straight away. If not, then you will manage according to the predominant uh, type, either cystic or solid. Uh, we reviewed our data uh, up to, 19, uh, to 2017. We had uh, uh, 121 craniopharyngioma patients. Uh, we included, I included in this uh, study, the patients that had more than two years follow-up, uh, which were 59 patients. The majority were males. The mean age was 19 years. 7% were solid, 23 were, uh, and 39% were cystic, and 54% uh, were solid, or, or mixed, uh, sorry. Uh, multi-cystic patients uh, in 19%. Uh, Before treatment, an omaya was placed in 42% of the cases, stereotactic aspiration in 7%, previous craniotomy in two-thirds of the cases, one case of re uh, previous radiotherapy, one case of previous bleomycin, shunt inserted in 20% of the cases, and in seven patients, gamma knife was a primary treatment. Field defect was present in 70% uh, of the cases, and in 23% there were no field defects. The other uh, four patients, uh, couldn't, uh, the uh, vision could not be assessed because too young or un uncooperative. 18% uh, uh, 18 patients were blind. The mean tumor volume was 8 cc's. The mean dose used was 10 grays. After treatment, the initial cyst expansion I mentioned before occurred in about a third of the cases. It occurred at a mean of six months. Uh, five, only five patients required the cyst aspiration, four from the omaya and one stereotactic. We had a mean follow-up of five years and a tumor, uh, an overall tumor control rate of 61%. Uh, the cysts uh, responded with a control rate of uh, 73%. The time to cyst recurrence was 40 months, and uh, there were seven patients in which the, a new cyst was formed. The solid tumor response was uh, a control rate of 89%, as you can see, much better than the cyst type. The visual outcome is, was favorable in 80% of the cases. In 20%, it was worse, but all due to tumor progression.
the uh, uh, prognostic factors were a better tumor control in adult patients, uh, in patients, uh, in, uh, also with better cyst control in adult patients, and better uh, control in non-cystic uh, cases. Retreatment was done in nine patients. One ha uh, eight patients had one treatment, one two treatments, and one three treatments. So the mean follow-up of the second treatment was four years. The tumor control was achieved in seven of nine patients, 78%, as we can see. And as you can see, the actuarial tumor control at 10 years was improved from 42 to 64%. Some illustrative cases of 41-year-old female patient with field defect having a solid craniopharyngioma. She underwent a subtotal resection. The residual tumor was 2.1 cc, treated with 10 grays. Uh, six years later, as you can see, the tumor had shrunk, some uh, visual improvement. A five-year-old male patient presenting with headache. He had a uh, mixed type craniopharyngioma. He underwent an endoscopic biopsy and cyst aspiration. Residual tumor was 12 grays. As you can see on the right, after endoscopic biopsy and cyst aspiration, this was the tumor. After gamma knife, uh, six months later, you can see the cystic part has slightly expanded. Then one year later, it disappeared. And this is at seven years, the tumor had markedly shrunk and the vision preserved. A 15-year-old male patient presenting with a field defect had a cystic craniopharyngioma, underwent omaya shunt. We did an aspiration on the same day, followed by radiosurgery. Uh, we gave 10 grays to 20 cc, 22 cc's. The, up, the upper uh, picture is uh, after the omaya aspiration. And the lower one is the uh, six-year follow-up. As you can see, cyst had shrunk with good control and vision unchanged. A six-year-old uh, male patient with headache uh, with a multicystic craniopharyngioma. We did a stereotactic aspiration for the largest cyst, and the residual cyst was treated with 12 grays. Uh, at the follow-up, uh, at the lower picture, uh, at 12 years, there was a new cyst formation on the right, as we can see. We treated this cyst, and this is two years later, after treating the new cyst, uh, the whole lesion is controlled. 18-year-old female patient presenting with hydrocephalus, she was shunted first. She had a mixed type craniopharyngioma. We put an omaya shunt in the... A large cyst, the residual tumor was treated with uh, uh, 10 and 12 grays. The lower uh, picture is uh, after two years of follow-up, you can see the tumor had shrunk. Unfortunately, three years after gamma knife, she developed another uh, new cyst in the uh, temporal cyst, as you can see. She was referred for surgery and uh, she was lost for follow-up. A 52-year-old female patient with field defects. She had a cystic craniopharyngioma. We put in an omaya. Uh, this is the lower picture after the omaya shunt insertion. We treated the residual with 12 grays. Uh, she required one aspiration during the first year for cyst expansion. Then, as you can see, the lower picture at five years, the cyst has completely disappeared and the vision unchanged. Last case, a 14-year-old female patient presenting with headache. MRI showed a supracellular cystic craniopharyngioma. She underwent two transphenoidal surgeries. This is before the first one. One month after surgery, you can see the cyst had regressed. Then uh, nothing was done for six months. The cyst recurred again. She did an another second transphenoidal surgery. The cyst had regressed. Another six months, nothing was done. So the cyst recurred again. Finally, she came for gamma knife. We treated the residual with 12 grays. And this is six months later, the cyst has regressed. So craniopharyngioma treatment is an individualized treatment for each case. It's a multimodal management, uh, can improve the recurrence-free survival and reduce the morbidity and mortality. Thank you so much.
any questions? Father Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Tumor progress after geniopharyngioma, when we can uh, uh, re-attacking surgery, uh, uh, which means uh, when the effect of gamma knife can be ex uh, 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 away from the, the, the tumor to re-excise again after uh, progression. Uh, uh, if we have a case of uh, geniopharyngioma which is managed by uh, uh, gamma knife, Okay. And we uh, not that progression of the Fate. of the tumor Fate. when we can uh, uh, attack uh, surgically hmm. safely. Okay. Uh, first question: uh, we, as as I uh, demonstrated, we had uh, cases in which we did three times uh, gamma knife for a case of carrying uh, 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 Of course, there is always the risk of uh, radiation-induced optic neuropathy. We have not experienced that so far. Uh, and usually what happens, the recurrence is usually is, is not in the same place. Uh, as I uh, mentioned also, usually what uh, recurs is not the same cyst. The uh, patient develops new cysts other cyst. in other uh, parts. So uh, probably that, that's what makes it uh, not, uh, uh, what, what makes it uh, safe uh, to an extent, yeah. Uh, your second uh, question, uh, when gamma knife fails, when you can the, do surgery? The second question, always we know, or we, we, we uh, mind it, and the gamma knife will difficult the surgery. Ah, uh, this, this is a, a big debate, and I don't think anyone can have a scientifically correct uh, answer for this. Uh, as we know, um, uh, de novo, uh, carinium pharyngiomas have different textures, different... Uh, adhesiveness to surrounding structures, so you can never know if this is related to the previous radiation or not. You know, you know this debate for acoustics for a longer time, and no one really has a uh, scientifically proven uh, uh, answer for this. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, Dr. Amr, I'm asking about the or uh, visual post uh, gamma knife. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you comment on visual film. It's a good uh, point. Uh, of course, uh, uh, visual acuity is important uh, because uh, most of our Korean pharyngioma patients are pediatric group, so uh, many of them cannot do a visual field. Yeah. Uh, usually what I noticed is uh, uh, visual acuity is uh, uh, more uh, uh, yeah, better, better than visual field. Uh, you can have a very bad visual field and still have a good visual acuity. So uh, we, if we consider the visual field to be the worst case scenario, the visual acuity is usually better than it. You have a, you can have a, a patient with a blind uh, visual uh, you know black visual field, and but he can still count fingers, so they are different, and I agree with you. Visual acuity sometimes can be more informative than a visual field. Doctor yeah. Amr, uh, what is the ideal presentation? Uh, ideal uh, post operative for gamma knife. Ideal time for gamma knife. Uh, usually we, we wait for uh, a couple of weeks, uh, maximum one month after surgery, because of the adhesions and the blood that's there in the, the region, in the area. Dr. Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed, I have a New cyst formation uh, or cyst recurrence, they are different. Uh, new cyst formation, um, uh, as, I, uh, as we saw uh, from our results at least, we, we saw uh, new cyst formations in about 10% of the cases. Uh, and this is our, uh, one of the main problems of craniopharyngeum. Cyst recurrence, as, uh, uh, as also I, m I mentioned, uh, can occur in up to 20 to 30% of cases, uh, as, as I also mentioned, because cysts are more uh, radio. Uh, uh, resistant than uh, uh, solid tumors. 
uh, and uh, uh, not really resistant more than they need a higher dose for control. Sometimes uh, this cannot be achieved if the cyst is in direct contact with the uh, visual uh, pathway. And that's why uh, we suggest an omaya before treatment because it uh, uh, reduces or uh, decompresses the cyst to create a distance between the cyst and the visual pathway. And this helps us in giving a higher dose that can control these cysts. Uh, cyst, new cyst formation related to cream pharyngioma. Ah, ah, not cream pharyngioma. Ah. So, I like Anis. New, new cysts uh, in general, for any place. Ah. Indu no, he's talking about induced cysts. Uh, Gamma-light induced cysts. Ah. It depends. Uh, it depends on pathology. I mean, it's, uh, the, it's a very uh, variable. Uh, uh, astrocytomas can have new cyst formation. Vestibular schwannomas can have new cyst formation. Sorry. Can can um, induce new cyst formation, but from uh, but from our uh, experience and we published on this, uh, the um, in ninety percent of the cases the cysts will uh, regress spontaneously with time. You will not you will not uh, need any intervention with them. Thank you, Professor Amr. Uh, session we are closed now. Mohammed. Thank you, Uriu. Uh, please. Uh, now we are going uh, to the questions of the session. Please, any uh, one of the undergraduate hoping to share in the uh, quiz, uh, his name, telephone, number, and his number, and he will send it to the lab. And at the end, we will see this story. You know that the prize is 30,000 euros. We will see this story. لا هم هنشوف الاخر نقسمهم 10 نقسمهم خمسه اوكي ورقه ونقفلها وفهد اللي جاي Question number one. Okay. Okay. Second question. Third question. دكتور باسم بيه نتعبك شوية سينوبراتان ارتري از ارتري اوف سفونويد فيس اور سيلر فيس اوكي كويستشن نمبر تو خلاص حد جاوب كويستشن اللي بعده هاو ميني بوينتس فورم ذا اوربت ويز انيوميريشن السؤال اللي بعده Classification of acrinopharyngioma in relationship to chiasm. That's all I'll have again. Hmm. 
sobre el vato. Complications of endoscopic approach for craniofaryngeum. Sobre el vato. Um reservoir is inserted in all cases of a craniofaryngeum, true or false, with correction if needed. Question le vado. Stereotactic radio surgery is safe for a craniofaryngeum without any recorded complications, true or false. في حاجة تانية؟ السؤال خلاص؟ اللي خلص بقى يجيب الأسئلة هنا للدكتور سامح أو في اللجنة بقى شكرا which is more responsive for SRS cystic or solid part of a craniofaryngeum مين اللي بيستجيب أحسن للجاما نايف؟ السيستيك ولا السوليد؟ Trabalho em B. Falas via certinho. Hana com sura gamaria ou o breakfast lá. الأسئلة يا إخواننا عشر دقايق، حد يسلمها للدكتور سامح أو اللجنة المنظمة.
Okay, okay. Languages. Thank you.